a stress. Kind of ironic that the system goes down when I'm about to talk about stress. And it's how we actually perceive stress, which is the big thing here. Because as I said earlier, we live in this world where we're stressed about being stressed because we're stressed about something that we're stressed about. And it all has this vicious circle that makes us have a massive impact on our health. We worry about someone's opinion of us that we don't even know who friend requested us two years ago on Facebook that we haven't even chatted about but may have liked our post once or twice. We stress about getting ready for a holiday that is 14, 15 weeks away and we diet for this holiday just to put pictures on Facebook worrying what we look like which causes more stress. And it gets into a vicious, vicious circle. And we have a certain tolerance of stress we can actually undertake every single day. And this stress stacks up. If we imagine this like a Jenga tower. Now, I really want this to work because I've got pictures of my dog on here and they're cute and that gets the audience on my side no matter what. So we'll, we'll, we'll go for that. You need to imagine the cutest dog in the world. But we've got this tower, a Jenga tower. All the blocks are loaded up three by three when we start the morning. Now, every time we have something go on, there's a stress stacker, and we're stressed out, and by the time we reach our stress threshold, that tower collapses. And with that tower collapsing, we then take it out on the person that's next to us. People that you love, you say you love, you start shouting at. People that are in your office, you start shouting at. You then get someone cut you off on the roundabout. You start shouting at them, not realizing that that person that cut you off on the roundabout was probably maybe late because their six months old baby kept them up all night and they're actually on their last warning at work because they've been late before because of that baby keeping them up. And if they're late to get to work, that will end up, they get their last warning, they're out the door, they've got no job to then feed that six month old baby. And when we put things into perspective, we're just annoyed because they cut us up, but probably don't even realize that. No one got hurt. We could get on with our day, leave that energy behind us. Let's take a basic day, for example, when it comes to, well, especially in our house, when it comes to your Jenga tower, our stress stackers build up. We wake up, six o'clock, 6.30, whatever it is, you wake up, you smash the sleep button on the alarm. Stress stacker one. <laughs> you then realize that the dogs that are laying on your bed have decided to go woo, 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 <laughs> all at their friend called Pussycat across the road. <laughs> then your sleep alarm wakes you up again. You go to step in your slippers. The dogs chewed one of them. <laughs> Stress stacker three right there. You go through and you start to cook your breakfast. You put your eggs on. Dogs go bloody nuts again. This time at their friend being walked because it's a pretty bad dog that snaps at people. They're shouting at it. You go through to get your dogs, now you've burnt your bloody eggs. <laughs> now the eggs are another stress stacker. And you think, screw it, I need to now put some oats on, put some porridge on or something. You put that in the microwave, you put it on, then you pick up your phone. Mm -hmm. You start scrolling and trolling. You see that annoying bitch from work that is there laying <laughs> Sunday on holiday <laughs> that you say you don't even like, and she's just, She's frustrated you so much because she's there, you've got to go into the office. From there, you see some horrible thing that's happened in the world by looking at the news app. Then, then you see your friend has seen the latest series on Netflix that you haven't seen. You've now got FOMO, fear of missing out, and you're going to have to go into work without seeing and binge watching this episode on Netflix and risk. You're going to risk losing the plot or finding out what happens, which is pretty nasty in consideration <coughs> that 10 years ago, five years ago, we didn't really have all this stuff on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Now, that then adds more and more stress to it. We then get the dogs ready to go for their walk. Dogs look all cute. Imagine a big picture here. <laughs> oh, we've got power. <laughs> I want dogs. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
dogs are cute. Unless you love cats, then maybe you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Why is that one not on? Don't look at me. Let's check the dog. <laughs> I don't do IT support. <laughs> this little girl just called. Oh. Is this yours? It's on here, they're on. I can see them. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should just go there. Ooh, what should we do? Does it just flicker? Anyway, you go to get your dogs ready for their walk. They're looking all cute. In their lead, you go out and they start going nuts again to their friend that they've seen. They're all really docile, amazing little friendly dogs. Couldn't harm a fly, but then they go snapping at their friend. Then it starts pissing it down. You're soaked. You get home, you think you've dried the dogs. All these stress stackers are stacking up. You then end up, look, oh my God, the dog's on the bed. There's muddy paws on the bed. Another stress stacker. Now you're going to be late for work. You run for the bus. And in running for the bus, you end up missing it. So you have to drive to work. <laughs> then, then there's some douchebag BMW driver that cuts you up. <laughs> I don't know what it is. As soon as you get a BMW, it ends up you become two spaces in one. And that's where we get these stress stackers that actually stack up. Oh, the dog. Oh. <laughs> Here we go. Where, where's Snowy? There he is. Oh. That's a stress dog, though. There's him on the bed. Oh. Right. And then your tower just falls over. And from there, we get to work, and then we realise that we don't even like the job we've got. And that's where reframing comes into it. Now, when I worked in insurance, I hated that job. I had anxiety attacks. I couldn't go near the place, I had three months off work trying to get my mind right. This was back in end of 2013. I lost management to Goldman due to offshoring. And it was horrible to actually see this. I went there with sweat, there's a chapter in my book about it, about thinking I was having a heart attack. But if I'd have gone in and realized that I'm selling insurance. Now, no one wants to really buy insurance. They end up, they go there, they get insurance because they have to have insurance, the law. However, if you imagine that person you've just sold insurance, he just had he's that guy that's late for work, and he ends up having a little bit of an accident at work. Now he hasn't got into work because of the accident. He's got a little bit of personal injury going on, and he needs to get some money for it. He's got money to feed his six-month-old kid. And from there, it makes me realize that I was actually putting in a bit of good work when it came to selling insurance. <laughs> We're going for it anyway. We just missed the dog pictures. But it ends up, if we can reframe it, your job, no matter what it is, is going to be a service to someone, somewhere. And once we can find out that service, it kind of makes going into work a little bit easier. And we do, though. I can't see who's going there. <laughs> second. We do need stress. Stress isn't all bad. We need stress in the short term, but the problem is, is that when it becomes... Ooh. <laughs> that's the wrong button. <laughs> do you want me to get the events team, lady? There's a, there's a phone on the thing. She's... Sorry, Ollie. Oh, right. this, this is warming this is, up now. It's a great yeah, topic because you are talking about stress. <laughs> too stressed. We get too stressed. In small doses, raising your blood pressure is great. It can help put blood to the brain. Long term, <coughs> chronic increase in high blood pressure can cause heart disease. It can cause stroke. It can cause many type 2 diabetes and all these sorts of things. Blood clotting can help save your life if you've got a massive cut. Your blood clots, great. It's going to stop you bleeding to death. Long term, it can 
increase the risk of strokes. It can increase the risk of heart attacks, deep vein thrombosis. Now, uh, increased insulin, short term, great. Your body isn't going to store blood and uh, sugar in your liver or your muscle cells. means there's more sugar ready for your brain to function. We don't need to be storing blood, uh, sugar in our muscle cells when a lion's chasing us, like it does every single day. But <laughs> long term, it can result in type 2 diabetes, uh, heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, and so on. Now, resources get directed to making that cortisol that we all hear about. It deals with immediate threats. And that actually stops us having libido and lowers our sex hormone production of estrogen and testosterone. Long term, it actually can mean that bringing on the menopause early, it can mean that you really have no sex drive, no matter what, because you had too much stress in your life. Resources get directed away from digestion. It's not essential for survival if you are so stressed about everything that's going on around you, which can cause IBS, bloat, and constipation. One of the reasons I've had high success rates of lowering IBS and even reversing it is because we focus on stress management. We focus on lowering the stress as much as we can, which then helps the digestive system work better, helps us get more nutrients from our food, helps us actually start to be able to have more energy and thrive. Small amounts of cortisol is gonna improve brain function. Long term though, cortisol is gonna kill nerve cells in your hippocampus, which is essentially the, end, like, the center of the brain. And it can have dementia, Alzheimer's, all these levels of stress. And it's great if you're in danger, long term, High stress can lead to anxiety, worrying, depression, even when essentially there's not much to worry about. And being in that situation when I had anxiety attacks, looking back, looking back and reframing it, having anxiety attacks was the best thing that could happen to me because it's helped me get to where I am now. Would I go back and have my dad here? Yes. But I could have that as a massive negative in my life. Would love to have him here right now. But him dying allowed me to be in this journey that I'm at, allowed me to stand here and speak to you guys. Therefore, I can be down about it. I get upset on his birthday, Father's Day, Christmas, and all these times, but I need to make use of his life and use that as drive to actually push forward. The problem that we've come to, though, in this world is that there's a lot of snowflakes about, and <laughs> they melt quite easily. And we get offended about so many different things. And things that didn't even think existed when I was a kid. I'm 32, 33 this year. So imagine what it was like 30, 40, 50 years ago. There's a reason that our parents, their parents, had higher testosterone levels than we do now. And that is pretty crazy when we think about it. We don't see how lucky we are. If any of you watch a guy called Gary Vaynerchuk, you'll probably be pretty familiar with what I'm about to say. But when we put things into perspective of stress, already, by being a human being here on this planet, you have hit the jackpot. You are 400 million to one chance. You've got 400 million to one chance of being a human being. It's 50 million to one to win the lottery. So you're four times more likely to win the lottery than actually be a human being, which is kind of crazy because you could have been an ant. Imagine that. Like we're stressed about all these things. There's a little thing down there that's got this bloody great foot that can stamp on it. And then we crawls on us and we're like, oh my God, get off of us. It's got to fall all the way to the floor. Could have been a slug. No. Poor man snail that couldn't afford the shell. I don't know why there's a Lego man there. Who, who had the idea of thinking that like, I'm going to do a photo and I'm going to do a slug. And then we point the finger. We point the finger and realize it's easy for you. It's easy for him to lose weight because he hasn't been overweight. Easy for him, he's in shape. They don't see what actually happens behind the doors. When I talk about that bodybuilding side of things, when I was so obsessed with eating that I missed my best friend's wedding. And I can't go back and change that, but I can learn from it. They don't see the cardio I was doing. They don't see the training five, six days a week. They don't see the meal prep that's going on every single day. But it's easy for them. It's easy for those people that we get the jealousy, we point the finger that that guy's got a Ferrari, dick. Like, why do we do that? Why do we hate these people that seem to have everything? We get jealous of it. We see a footballer and say they get paid too much. 
But if we were getting paid 100 grand a week, I bet you'd think differently. Could we do a lot more for charity? Maybe. We point that finger and don't realize that the things that are stressing us out a lot, we're pointing that finger and there are three pointing back at us. There's a lot of jealousy going on in the world and actually without evaluating and putting things into perspective, we don't realize that we're getting stressed about things that probably don't matter as much. We think they do, but when we put them into perspective, it's not really as much to stress about. Now, there are seven billion people in this world, roughly. I'm not allowed to count. Now, if we look here, we're all here in the forum in Norwich. Some people may hate Norwich. I do like Norwich. I do like leaving Norwich, though. I'm coming back. But you're here in Norwich. It's freezing out there. You've got a roof over your heads. Chances are you drove here. Chances are you've got a phone in your pocket with access to the internet. You go on Facebook, you go on social media. You're going to go home and there's heating there, there's running water. When we look at the populations from one to seven billion, we're probably in the top bit. Pretty much in the top bit. And we worry that we've got a problem. We worry we've got no money and all this stuff. And then we number these from one to seven billion down here. Then, if you're the seventh billion person in the world, you've probably got something to moan about. <laughs> Maybe the second last person in the world, you've got something to moan about. When we look at how lucky we are to live in a country that, dare I say it, has only got Brexit, that's going wrong, some other things, that's the biggest thing that's going wrong. There are people that are living in poverty every single day. And then, I mean, we could have a wall being built between here and Scotland or something to moan about, or something like that, but. That's not good at politics. Another thing, delete the news app off your phone. There's so much time back. And Facebook if you can. But there was a film called Happy, which was out a few years back. And there was a guy in India with a tuk-tuk. Tuk-tuk driver. And in fact, another show, a guy I met up with in, um, in America, a guy called Leon Logafetis. If any of you got Netflix, watch The Kindness Diaries, because you can see a similar thing to this. The series is coming out again second series where it goes around the world based on the kindness of others. This guy's got a tuk-tuk and we think, he's not got much money, he's got a tuk-tuk, he's there earning his living, he says, it's great, I can go home and I can see my kids and I can have a laugh with them, it's great. He lives in a house similar to some of the places here and his house has a tarpaulin on the front and when it rains in the summer or there's a monsoon or something like that, water gets in, but they interview him. And I don't know how they measured it, but his level of happiness was the same as the equivalent of happiness level, or of level of happiness of 70% of the American population. <laughs> this guy had next to nothing. But he said, yeah, it rains, but it dries. It also means we get cooler in the summer when it's really boiling hot, when it's really humid. And we think, we're actually really lucky here. But this guy here, if we were in those conditions, we'd probably be stressing out because we haven't got nothing, we haven't got access to the internet, we haven't got our mobile phones and so on. But how can we manage stress? <coughs> There's only a certain amount we can tolerate before that stress mm -hmm. damper topples over, before we then start taking it out on our poor unsuspecting husbands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get it and I get home. How can we manage stress? The first thing we can do is get some good nutrition in. One great thing is to look at is eating as many different fruits and veg as possible. Get from A to Z as much as possible. There's so many different foods out there. And if you message me, I can send you a chart that has all the different foods. It puts courgette and zucchini in because they couldn't find another Z. So there's a bit of Americanism in there. But getting this food is gonna help repopulate your gut. Uh, it's gonna help get the good bacteria in. The better we can get our gut, it's essentially the second brain because it has to send signals, feel good signals to the brain. Now if that gets blocked up, it's like trying to get from Fort to Cossie on the A47 when there's a broken down tractor or something like that. It just gets tails and tails. And it's just literally, we have to get rid of that blockage and get a nice, good uh, direction to get there. Now, we can get hydrated. And again, you can get hydrated having coffees and teas. We'll get to that in a minute. People say that caffeine is a diuretic, it is. However, Chances are there's only a tiny bit of caffeine compared to the amount of water. It's still going to help hydrate you. Another great thing you can do is just meditate and breathe. Now, 
It was my wife that pointed out how consistent I've been at meditation, how consistent I've been at my morning routine. Because, I said, I'm not perfect. She didn't say I was, but I'm not perfect. <laughs> and most of the time, I will actually do this meditation and I'll spend 10, 15 minutes doing meditation and a couple of other things. And it really helps ground you at the start of the day. Meditation and breathing exercises, and we don't appreciate how much it actually happens to be working for us, how good it is on our body. Just breathing, box breathing, has been shown to actually help people lower stress and help people lose weight. There are people who have done exactly the same diet, exactly the same exercise plan. They were in a calorie deficit. I don't know their health history beforehand, but the people that actually managed their stress through breathing lost more fat than the people that didn't over 12 weeks, uh, which is pretty crazy when you think of it, they're doing exactly the same thing. And what you can also do, manage your stress, is just walk in nature. People say walk with your shoes off and stuff like that. I wouldn't really recommend that in mouse hole or something, but <laughs> it, you, you want to be walking around, go to the beach, and it can help ground you with nature. And to be honest, until you actually start doing that, when you go to the beach and things, then you're probably going to be a skeptic, just like I was. Exercise, again, exercise is dependent on the dose. It can be good for you, it can be bad for you. When you go to the extremes like I did, you get massive overtraining. I was training for the London and Edinburgh Marathon in 2015 and ruptured both my Achilles because I was overtraining, doing powerlifting and endurance at the same time, which I do with my clients, but I was doing too much. I wasn't treating myself like a client. So you can do exercise, but remember that exercise does increase your stress levels. So just be careful not to activate beast mode too much. And the next one, I love, because we could all just have a dance. We could all just be sitting there going, I'm so happy, clap along if you feel like happiness is the... Her face. It's what we call just going crazy, not giving a damn. She calls it being a twat, but it's just having a laugh. The more we can have a laugh, don't take ourselves too seriously. Don't get offended at what people say all the time. Because, yes, I swear. I swear in front of my mum. Didn't used to swear in front of my nan. But as I've always said, if I would say something in front of my mum, I will say it on Facebook. So have fun. Have a laugh. Oh, we've got a dog picture coming up in a second. <laughs> Caffeine. Coffee. I love coffee. Now, <clears throat> caffeine is great. Whoever invented it, genius. However, too much of it, it is a stimulant. It's going to hit your central nervous system a lot. It has a half-life of around five, six hours, depending on where you look. Now, that essentially means the half-life is that if you have a cup of coffee that has got 200 milligrams of caffeine, five hours later, you've got about 100 milligrams left in your system. Therefore, 10 hours later, you've got about 50 milligrams. Therefore, if you have an Americano, say a large Americano with 200 milligrams of coffee at 12 o'clock, if you go to bed at 10 o'clock, it's pretty close to actually just getting a small Americano and drinking it before bed. That's something we need to take into account. Also, uh, ladies, if you want a contraceptive pill, or men, let's not discriminate, um, if ladies want a contraceptive pill, they can double the half-life. Therefore, if you're having coffee in the morning, chances are it probably will still be in the system in the evening. And that's not to say cut caffeine out. Definitely don't go cold <coughs> turkey, because I made that mistake, and you end up laying on the floor feeling sorry for yourself for about five or six days. Uh, but just be aware of the amount of caffeine that is in there. Asleep. Aww. In your trousers. Aww. In my trousers. It doesn't fit there anymore. Exactly. Not that big enough. Well, he's that big, but that's Dexter. And this one is sleep. We underestimate how much we need sleep. Just speaking to Rachel there. And we look at sleep as an extra on top of things. Now... In fact, what I'll do in the live feeds, if any of you see the live feeds, and I'll put in the group the link to the podcast that Roger and I have done on sleep, which last week's and this week's, so I'll put that in the group so you guys can see that uh, and listen to that. But we talk on sleep for two episodes. Sleep is so important, and it helps us rebuild those building blocks for Jenga. It helps us restore that tower so we're not as close to our stress threshold earlier in the, as earlier in the day. Sleep also helps us with our hormones. There is proof to say that your testosterone levels, after 30, go down 1% roughly each year when doing things to help it. However, if you sleep for six hours or less, for around two weeks, 
then your testosterone levels are going to go down 10 to 15 percent. So you're roughly going to age hormonally 10 to 15 percent, or 10 to 15 years in two weeks. And that is done on men, not women who have lower testosterone levels, which are still going to have pretty similar results. Another thing is that we look at our heart rate. Now I am rushing through these a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, we will go through them at the end. Just aware of the time, but our heart rate variability is quite a big thing because we have our heart rate beating, and it seems that we think it's going to beat like a metronome on point every single time. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And what actually happens is that there is variability between these beats, and the higher they are, the more tolerance to stress we've got, the less stressed we are. And you see a lot of footballers nowadays missing games, and this was a conversation I had with a guy who was Real Madrid's nutritionist, that's where you come from, and he does the heart rate variability, and they measure their heart rate variability, so you might see a footballer that is actually not playing, and then you see the media say this guy's going to get dropped because he's, he's had a fallout on the, on the training pitch. A lot of the times, not saying always, but a lot of the times, the heart rate variability might be a red or an orange, so they might feel good but they end up training and take two, three, four days as long to actually recover. And you can get apps nowadays where you just put your finger on the camera of your phone, elite HRV, weltery, these sorts of things where we can measure our heart rate variability pretty easily. It's annoying when your finger slips or the dog jumps on you and you have to start again. But it's easy to measure them. One thing we don't do as much is, is that wedding photos? Uh, is getting intimate with each other. And that is something where I'm a culprit for it. We all have been at some times where we'll sit on the sofa next to our partner and just be scrolling through Facebook. We might as well be in a complete other world. Where if we could just turn our phone off, put it in another room or something, we'll actually be more present, holding hands. And actually being intimate, hugging people, not even necessarily having sex. Hugging people releases oxytocin, which is essentially, people call it the help, uh, the help, the hug hormone, which makes us feel good, makes you feel safer, makes you feel more relaxed. And that is a big thing which I feel a lot of people, especially in relationships, me definitely, can actually do more of and be more present, switching off at certain times. When you go out on date night or something like that, leaving your phone at home. If you have people that want to call you, just simply get one of those £10 pays you go phones and give the number to your closest. It's as easy as that. And that goes with social media. With social media, we are scrolling through it every single day. There's an app uh, called Moment or Momentum, one of those two, which tracks how many times you pick up your phone. And I looked at it, I'm like, bloody hell, I pick up my phone 45 times a day and I'm on it for three hours a day. I don't know if it tracks when I do Facebook Lives, I need to look into that, but it tells you what you're actually doing on your phone. And that's where that awareness comes in. We spend so much time on our phone. And if we think about three hours a day, every single day, that's what, <clears throat> over a thousand hours a year that we spend on our phones, that we're not connected with the people next to us. And we usually do it in the evenings. In the evenings, we have a bath. <laughs> this is what the challenge is getting me, dog pictures in as I can. <laughs> but we have a bath. That was Dexter's first bath back in 2014. And that helps get us ready for bed, and that comes to this whole routine of getting ready for bed, switching off technology, getting ready for bed by having a bath. When we go to sleep, our core temperature has to lower, and it signals to the body that I'm ready to relax, ready to switch off. Not when we're stressing about binge watching the latest episodes on Netflix, when we're actually in bed, after this bath, core temperature goes down, and it helps tell the body we can rest, we can recover, we can get into REM sleep nice deep levels of recovering sleep. And with that, one of the things I do is journal a lot. I also read, there's, there's a book called The Daily Stoic. I read one page of that every day, set out every single day. But journaling, writing down the success from the day before, which I do on the morning, some people do in the night. But I have my five M's that I listed at the start, and I go through madness. Did I have fun yesterday? No, that gets a one. Did I do something that's going to help me get my business higher levels, get more money in? Five. Great. Uh, did I do something that is going to help me with movement and exercise and get good nutrition in? Yeah, okay, three. And I mark it where you can essentially get 25 points a day. 
And then you see where you are. You start to gamify it. Just like when you get Apple Watches and different watches that tell you you've had a, a streak going on of hitting your steps. These things really do help when it comes to getting your stress levels down in a matter of lowering perspective. And this one is, as you'll probably recognize, Muhammad Ali. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, but he was one of the guys that I first saw giving himself affirmations, which is telling himself how great he is. We seem to be worried about telling yourself how great he is. I know I'm absolutely amazing at what I do. No one can do what I do because I am me. And it took so long for me to actually say that to myself because people are saying, you can't say you're good because you're arrogant. You can't say how great you are because you're gonna see as loving yourself too much. In a world where it's, it's wrong to love yourself. Now, Muhammad Ali was saying he's the greatest and then he went and proved it, but he had to tell himself first. It wasn't like he was just saying it to everyone just to be big headed and have his ego. Maybe he did have a bit of an ego, I've never met the guy. But, I never will obviously. But he ended up saying it so much that he believed it himself, which gave himself a lot of confidence when he got into that ring of actually doing what he said he would do. And that is a big thing, because if you get all these things lined up, if you manage your nutrition, if you manage your hydration, if you manage your stress levels by having a bath, having a sleep, getting breathing, going for walks, do your grat uh, gratitude diaries, do, do your affirmations, we then end up rebuilding our tower block. And the closer we can get to a block looking like that, rather than smash down when we start the day, let's move that wine out of the way, <laughs> we can get fruit in there. But there's one behind there as well, they notice that. The closer we can get to that block, the less we're going to take it out on those people around us. Because when we take stress out on the people around us, they get defensive. I know I do. And I get stressed back, which then just leads into loads of bickering. And it's not nice. It just adds more stress. And look into perspective. So when it comes to stress, we need to find what we call stress stackers. Find those things that are stressing you out and get aware of them. Awareness is so key. If we're aware that that alarm is going to stress us out, we'll be ready for it to go off. And when it goes off, because we're going to be aware that it's stressing us out, it's not going to stress us out as much. If you don't get dogs, you won't be stressed out as much. <laughs> no one told us that. Get a beagle, they said. We've got two. Rebuild your tower with as much things that you can do as possible. So that's sleep, it's loving yourself, and it's spending time with others. <coughs> don't get a dog. <laughs> uh, that is stress management. Okay, I've gone over it a bit quicker than I was going to. Uh, has anyone got any questions on stress, on the nutrition from the first bit at all? Go for it. Um, I've, I've read that um, the glucon intolerance, that part of that's related to glycophosphates, and it's a reaction to that rather than gluten. It can be, to be fair, a lot of people with gluten sensitivities, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the gluten that's in the food they're reacting to, it's probably some other ingredient that's in the food. Yeah. Uh, it can be that, it can be so many different nutrients, so many different chemicals in the food nowadays. Yeah, yeah. and also as well that uh, we can stress ourselves out too much by even looking at how much <laughs> is in food. Yeah. And not knowing is sometimes, it's better to be ignorant about it because we don't realise it's in there and sometimes it is in our heads as well. I know with me that sometimes if I have food and I know there's gluten in, I'll react. If I don't know there's gluten in, I don't react as much. Now, as I said before, when I was going through the stress at Aviva and I had time off sick, I had the test done there and I was diagnosed with celiac. And three years later, just after we'd given away all the wedding cake, I ended up having the test again and not celiac. And that was at the same time of having an underactive thyroid. Don't take any thyroid medication now. I haven't had it tested again because, to be fair, I can't really be bothered to go for a blood test when it's not low in my energy or anything. Uh, but there's no signs of underactive thyroid now. There's, I still have sensitivity with gluten. If I'm more stressed, my eyes will blow up. Uh, and in fact, as we said about, uh, my friend from Canada randomly went to stay with you, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And I he lived literally two minutes away from me. How, having a friend there is crazy. But we went out to fat serves, had loads of nachos. Mm -hmm. The day after, my eyes just blew up. The gluten, the dairy, and all that stuff, it tasted so good, <laughs> but it just blew up. So it's, it's all about, I suppose, yes, we can be aware of it, but it isn't necessarily gluten that's the devil. Gluten can be totally fine, it might be something else that's in there. 
and we all react at different levels. If our stress levels are really low, our body will be able to digest a hell of a lot more than we think. And we might think that we've got an intolerance to something, but if our stress levels are low, we can still eat that food. And as well, eating the same thing, we want to just get a lot of variation in our diet. Eating the same thing can just allow us to lower our health a lot. I know when I was doing bodybuilding, eating exactly the same thing every single day, and that was a horrible time, prepping my food. My mum will tell you firsthand that every single thing was weighed out, and I was so anal about it, I would stress myself out. Mm -hmm. I would forget my protein shake at work, and then be stressing about going to macros to get a tin of tuna, and then be like, oh my God, it's not a protein shake. I was that bad about it. I got so obsessed, which it can be done without that. 100% can, I know loads of people that can. Uh, but at that time, it wasn't the right thing for me, and it would stress me out more. Go for it. See the sleep one, right? Yep. Is that an optimum amount or more? Everyone is going to differ. Because, like, if I sleep over eight hours, I'm useless the next day. But say tonight, I've got to be up early, I'll probably get about five and a half, maybe five hours sleep, but I'll be on point in the morning. Yeah. Now, with sleep, as I say, it's about consistency over time. There are going to be days where, I mean, I'm usually in bed at nine o'clock, reading my book, half nine, quarter to ten, obviously. But there are going to be days when you're not going to be able to sleep that. Now, I can stress it out because I'm missing my bedtime. And But there's days that you're going to sleep a little less. I'll still get up at the same time tomorrow. A lot of people get that Monday morning feeling because they have a routine and then Friday night they go out, go for a takeaway. Saturday they're getting up late. Sunday they get up late, try to push themselves to bed earlier the next day. And then the Monday morning they're essentially jet lagged. Now, people can get too much sleep and feel groggy and stuff like that. Sometimes you need it. But if you're constantly needing to get 12, 13 hours of sleep and feeling tired, there's probably something else going on in there um, that is making you sleep that much. And there's energy needed to come from your diet for stress management, meditation, breathing, things like that. Uh, but when people say eight hours, just like with that 1,500 calories or 2,000 calories, mm -hmm. I really don't like pinpointing an exact number. The studies show that six hours or less for general population will lower testosterone. But again, there are some people that potentially could start getting that amount of sleep, start getting used to it, and then catch up at the weekend. Everyone is going to be different, but it's awareness around, are you actually sleeping as much as you want? Or are you actually staying up later to watch TV, which you could watch at the weekend? That sort of thing. Uh, so it's, it is going to be dependent on the individual. Uh, so it's not going to be eight hours, and that's exactly it. Sometimes nine will be right. Sometimes nine will be too much. I suppose it depends on your activity level during the day. It might be worthwhile taking a, a stress diary. So like people do a food diary, do a stress diary so you can then see what stressed you out, mix that with a sleep diary and see, has, have I been more stressed the day after having less sleep? Tomorrow, does something impact you at work? Uh, I know some people that have done heart rate variability diaries. On a Wednesday night, they've had a stressful patient or something that's a doctor, and then they've ended up to Friday, they hated work, um, and Thursday, they hated work. Now, they ended up going home after that time, having a drink, having alcohol, but rather than doing that, ended up going home, doing some yoga, heart rate variability went up, and he ended up being able to manage stress better with the same amount of sleep. So there, there are gonna be other factors going on in the lifestyle, kind of long answer on that. <laughs> but that's why your podcast is really good, and it would be good to watch that, yeah. because it's not, we focus on the amount of hours we're getting, but actually it's the quality of sleep that we're getting within we'll that. Always have top quality sleep. Yeah. I never sleep that good. You know, I could do horrendous things if I'm sleep soundly. But, but it's sleep just, soundly isn't you know, necessarily quality if you wake up really groggy. Because a lot of people sleep for yeah, eight, nine so. hours, but then they wake up groggy. Yeah. Alcohol is a sedative. People sleep for however long after alcohol, but it's a sedative and their central nervous system is going to be stimulated throughout that sleep. Therefore, they're not getting yeah. deep into the sleep cycle and actually having this sleep cycle, which occurs every around 90 minutes. Therefore, they're not getting the regenerative sleep that they could do. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of look how you feel in the morning. So, um, if anyone does want to contact me, there's other questions as well, if you want. But Twitter, Instagram, then we've got Revitalization Blueprint with a Z. I'm not going to change it back to an S yet, but... Um, podcast, Revitalization Blueprint podcast. We've got uh, the Innate podcast as well, which is um, the Unplugged Health. I keep getting series or, or seasons. 
the mm -hmm. series, uh, which is on it's on iTunes, but we've got it on Facebook, we've got it on YouTube. Again, I will put the sleep link into the Yes group um, group and the books as well. If anyone does want to buy a copy, they're five pounds, just like they are on Amazon down here. If anyone wants one, so mm -hmm. cool. Anyone else with any other questions? Go for it. Yes. So we heard a great story. How did you change yourself as a person or as a human being, as you say? But you never talked about the days when you struggled. You didn't want to go gym. You didn't. Maybe you did. You had a mindset that oh, I can't be asked with this today. How did you deal with yourself then? How did you push yourself, push that extra mile to you to be who you are right now? It depends. Like when I was doing the bodybuilding show, I was going no matter what. Now, if I feel really, really bad, I'll cut a gym session out. Because if my body is stressed, going and adding more stress to it might make it worse. What motivates you to get up in the morning, for example? The fact that I didn't want to take my t-shirt off when having sex, that was a big thing. And now as well, which I work with clients that are going to be over 30 more than likely. And they've got their family, they've got a busy business. And then speaking with them as well, what motivates them is going to be what happened with my dad, that he died at 47. I'm 33 this year. And if I looked at that with that, when uh, I want to climb Mount Everest on my 47th birthday. Uh, so it's setting big goals to do it. but. I know that every single thing has a step towards where I want to go. And like right now as well, I'll go out when it's bloody freezing to run. Like, but my wife will go out with the dogs and say, it's like an ice skate, an ice rink out here, so don't go out. But I'll go on my turbo training and we'll do it, that sort of thing. But if I'm ridiculously stressed, didn't get very good sleep, if I go to the gym, it'll be a very long <coughs> session, 20 minutes or something of movement and rolling. Not heavy at all, not deadlifting heavy like I used to. and bench press and stuff like that, it's very light stuff. Now if you'd have told me when I was doing that short training that I would be like that now, I'd be like, man, it's, it's just been a week and it's just not right to do that sort of training. At the time when I was doing it, it's hard to say what motivated me because it would be an obsession to just do it because I got into that position. Now, getting on stage and posing Trump does kind of motivate you when everyone wants to see everything. Um, you can't hide anything on there. <laughs> So that kind of motivates you when you know you've got to stand on stage with next to nothing on. However, in the first place, just getting to the gym, motivating, having someone there as well to keep me accountable. I have coaches in business. I've had many different trainers over the years for different events that I've looked to do. I've had coaches for bodybuilding. Knowing that they're keeping me accountable, just like I say with my clients, that I'm an accountability coach. I was over, when I said about Rick, uh, Taylor's manager, when I was over there in Nashville, he used to be, oh, he still goes to Alcoholics Anonymous and he hasn't had a drink for like 25, 30 years, but he said, you're my accountability partner. He just checks in and we started with him, we're just going on the treadmill 10 minutes a day, sending a WhatsApp to me to say, look, I'm working out. And it was about finding that minimum dose and building the accountability, building the consistency up. Now, I'm still got some obsessive personality, which helps me be successful like I am, because I don't like to break the streak. If I see there's an app that has eight days, I don't want to go back to one. Therefore, if I've got something like Headspace or something like that and it's building up a, a streak, I don't want to go back to one. I don't want to go back to number one on uh, this is your longest streak on exercise or movement, of hitting your movement goal. And gamifying it for me really helps. Getting a calendar, red uh, cross through it every single day, has helped so many of my clients just get results because they're able to see that Every time they've done what they said they're going to do, they put a red cross in and they start building up lines. They've got their family that, like, one of my clients in Canada, he's had his family put that red cross in the calendar. So his boy then had to put that cross in. His boy comes up to him and says, Daddy, have you done what you need to do? He's about to say no to his boy, I haven't done it because I haven't been committed to it. So it's finding as an individual what motivates you. Because what motivates me now didn't motivate me when I was bodybuilding. What motivated me when I was bodybuilding didn't motivate me to lose 100 pounds. And Everything is going to be different every single day. Perfect today is going to be different tomorrow. So yeah, that, there's the motivation side of things. It changes. Anyone else? Go for it. Have you got any tips in terms of gaining balance? So um, I would say as a healthy weight, but this kind of strive for perfection, you know, in the Instagram world, just to be happy with healthy rather than keep pushing it. I think it's looking at what is perfection to you, what actually does balance look like, and finding those steps to move towards it. If it's because there's someone on Instagram that's doing some random pose, 
every single day and gets 3,000 likes, but we put something out and it gets two likes or something, and we get annoyed about it. Perfection, as I said, it's different based on the day of the week. Um, I'll still get impacted sometimes when I see people bodybuilding and think, maybe I should bodybuild, maybe I should do that. But then I think of the negative side of what actually happens with that. If it's that, what are you struggling with? Are you struggling with the fact that it's taking time away from friends and family by preparing your food? Would there be more balance if you just counted your calories for a little bit and got some intuitive eating going on now? Intuitive eating is a great thing. People say you should just eat intuitively, which I can do now, but because I track food, every single gram that went into my mouth for God knows how many years, it's not something that just happens overnight. And I think that's a process. Then happiness and being feeling good is being in the moment. There's a, um, what really did change my life, there's a, a film called The Peaceful Warrior. It's a true story, a guy called Dan Millman who was an Olympic gymnast and he broke his legs. True story is, it's on YouTube, it's very low quality on YouTube, if not it's like five pounds on Amazon. But I watched that, I watched that, mm -hmm. I watched that, and it completely changed the way I thought about things. What's it called again? The Peaceful Warrior. Oh, yeah. And um, it's a book as well, but I'm quite lazy if there's a film out. I've never read the Harry Potter books, but I love the DVDs. <laughs> and people say you should read the books, but I listen to audio books when I'm running, um, and it's just better like that. But yeah, that, that film really changed the way I look at things, and he talks about what is going on. So there's nothing going on. They're walking through a park, and there's a bird tweeting, a dog catching a ball. There's a couple having their first kiss. There's never nothing going on. And when we realize that we can be in the moment, what actually is going on outside doesn't really have to impact us as much. I, you touched on it earlier, and um, all our slide, I think, about um, love yourself. And I personally think that that is a massive part of it, because when you are content and happy with who you are, and I guess you started that process once you realised that you could look in the mirror without yeah. your T-shirt, you then start to value yourself a bit more and you're feeling the benefit of that. And like you said about you know the perfect weight, there is the only perfect weight is the weight that you're happy with when you find that love that you are happy with yeah. who you are. And you can only do that by going, going on a journey, I believe. I think we're all still on a journey as well. If I said that I never have days where I'm low in confidence, I'd just be completely BSing you guys. There are days when I'm low in confidence and I have to put in a lot of work to just think, oh, I could just sit here and play on PlayStation all day because I put myself in that position to do that, but it wouldn't be productive. Uh, well, doing play, watch, watching uh, TV or playing PlayStation while on your turbo trainer is kind of easy to do on your bike in front of the TV, but it's, it's to realize that what is perfection? It's different to me, it's different to you. I'm not perfect every day. In fact, I would hate to be perfect every day because where do you go from there? and they're always striving to move forward. And as you say, being on that journey, there are still times when I'll feel bloated and not want to take my top off. It, it happens. And I think being open and honest and knowing that these people that, I read a course about Instagram, who's this girl who's in San Diego, I believe, or LA area, really big fitness uh, personality. And I got the course off uh, my old coach and She's talking about don't put a picture up without putting whiteners on your teeth. <laughs> and then talking about being confident. And to me, that just, it seems fraudulent in a way. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. people can say that, put out this information about loving yourself, but yeah, I'll put some filters on stuff. But most of the time, it's just, it is what it is. I'll have, have pictures taken. Uh, one of my clients took these pictures in Brighton. And she was my first ever client. I help her now. She helps me with some pictures. I'm not a bloody model just because I had a photo shoot, uh, but a lot of people put that perspective into our heads that they're a model or they're loving their life more than they are. I think awareness of that helps. We never know what's actually going on with the other nine throwback Thursdays they didn't put on or the other five or ten selfies they didn't they deleted before they put on the one they wanted. But it takes time. It, it doesn't happen overnight and there's there'll always be days when you find, oh my God, have I just gone completely back to the start? And that's where you realise where you've come and move forward. Don't you think that the media plays a big part in it? They portray
portray an image that you're nobody unless you look like this, you've got this. Yeah, massively. And everyone looks at that and reads it. Mm. Yeah, and also when it comes to fitness magazines as well, people diet down for these photo shoots. <coughs> they diet down really hard diet for these photo shoots and end up, they're in that shape for a week or two. They have loads of photos taken. I was the worst one when it came to the photos would be on my Facebook page looking really amazing shape and then people would think I looked like that year round and it would put pressure on myself. And the media doesn't help because it's telling us what we can do, what we can say. And it tells us we have to say certain things and it's not politically correct to say this, to say that. And I mean, I'll put something in the start of my book aimed at women is that this is written in a guy's perspective, not and some things may not be politically correct. Not because I'm sexist or anything like that, it's purely because of the fact that it's hard to keep up with what is actually PC nowadays because of what's going on in the media. And I can only be me, I can only be the best person that I can be for myself to then be the best for other people around there. And the media helps blur that so much, so much. And we can't airbrush ourselves like they do. No. Mm. You know, you find out that it's the people who take the most selfies and it's those perfect images on social media. And you get to know the people behind and they're some of the most insecure people who absolutely despise themselves. Yeah. So they put it out there because they want the, oh my goodness, you look so amazing, Attention. because it, it yeah. boosts their ego mm -hmm. and it, it helps them feel good enough. So actually it's when you do look at pictures mm -hmm. like that that we should be quite the opposite empathy for that person. Massively, yeah. It's, uh, I think I'd heard a, a, <coughs> a stat that um, over half um, the people, um, women that have um, breast surgery mm -hmm. end up committing suicide in their life mm -hmm. after well, it's one of those things when it came to losing the weight and putting muscles on, I thought that developing muscles would give me confidence. It made me like the complete opposite and it made me so paranoid about what people thought of me, what putting pictures on Facebook was like. And it wasn't, wasn't actually until a few years ago that I started developing a lot more confidence in myself and what I'm actually capable of. And going around, uh, speaking to that guy in the Diamond Star, I said to him, I want to impact a million people. He said, you probably already have. You've been in this industry for 12 years. You've got a podcast that gets two, three thousand downloads a month. You've got thirty-five thousand followers on Twitter or something like that, and however many on Instagram and so on. If each one of them gets one person gets something and they tell someone else and they tell someone else, plus the thousands of clients you've worked with, you've probably impacted a million people already. And I think that's pretty powerful. Massively powerful. But the only way I can do that and be honest about things is to be myself. And I think it's actually it could be easy just to lie about stuff and uh, to get more likes for it, that's, likes aren't really going to pay the bills. And someone said to me as well before, like, would you have got further if you didn't swear all the time? Okay, time and place maybe, but if I didn't swear, I wouldn't be being myself. Said, I don't fucking know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't swear, I wouldn't be being me. It would be, yeah, it'd be wrong. So that, that's pretty crazy to, to think that we have to be politically correct every single way. Maybe if we're in. in the House of Commons or whatever, that we've got to be a bit more politically correct than in here. Really? Yeah. Probably not, yeah, that was a bad example. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> guys, I really appreciate you. It's longer than we actually uh, were well, hey, you've, got, you've got until half past nine if, you, if there are any more questions. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was nine. No, I, I, I did wonder, and then I thought, <laughs> there'll be questions. So. That's why I put the break at 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? <laughs> Um, now, I've just got a real problem at home at the moment because my husband has just, he's actually just turned 70. He's still working like 12, 13, 14 hour days. He has collapsed five times. Um, he's had a pacemaker fitted. That didn't help. He still collapsed afterwards. As a result, he's been told he can't drive, which has now made him even more stressed because he has to go everywhere by bus or get lifts and things. And so he's having five five or six hours sleep at the most. And I just don't know what to do with him, to be honest. He's just, he's completely obsessed. He, he gets up really early, goes for about an hour's really strict walk every day, which, okay, it's not, not particularly bad for him, but, you know, I mean, it, at 70, should, is, is he still okay to be doing all this? I, I don't know what he's doing to himself. I honestly can't answer that because no, the route of medical no. history and stuff it is kind of be irresponsible. So yeah, it's fine to do that, and then something else happens. But when it comes to the people that are closest to you, they've got to want to, and they've right. got to want to put in that effort to change. Not you want.
determined to change them. And I find just like with Laura, my wife, that if I push her to do something, it pushes her further away yeah, from doing it. And know, you can lead by example and uh, push your help forward. But the more we try and push these people to where we think they want to be, the more they're going to get defensive, more than likely. Yeah. And a lot of the times it's come down to maybe parents working hard. Uh, I was having this discussion with a client who had lost his dad as well yesterday. And we were talking about how his dad was and how his work ethic goes. And I just want to push forward with work. And I want to help more people. But in reality, that ends up making me stressed to trying to help people. Yeah. And we see what our parents done. And a lot of us get these habits and work ethics from our parents. Yeah, and we yeah. think, well, what has happened in his life to think that if he stops, that everything's going to break down around him or something like yeah, that? Yeah. What is, is, who is he trying to provide for? I think he's got a lot of guilt and stuff. So, that's, so it, yeah. it might be a case of, again, going to see a professional in that to, to lower the guilt uh, and find out what has actually triggered it. I, I had a client who just finished working with him and he had a lot of issues where he completely, he broke down in CrossFit, he used to be in the college basketball team years ago and it was all about getting to a certain amount and then self-destructing mm. and we had to realise what actually was happening yeah. and it all came from his childhood and the way he was treated with his parents that there was self-destruction there because of that and he would get really high in the college basketball team and stop got pretty close to qualifying for the CrossFit Games, had to literally completely overtrained and had to stop and now as soon as he starts building momentum there's some sort of trigger that was happening mm. that he ends up not giving up, but getting frustrated and stopping. And that was all from speaking about childhood. Talking about it helped. Talking about it helped yeah. a hell of a lot. Uh, so, again, though, it's only going to frustrate you more if you're trying to get him to change. Yeah, I don't want him to change. I just, I'm just concerned for him because, yeah. you know, he is only having like five hours sleep. The sleep is, is something where a lot of people need to. Um, to see the benefit of having it before they start having it which is kind yeah. of hard to do and they need to hear it from a lot of people before they then start having it my mum is quite bad i'll tell her something three months later she'll see it in the daily mail and say have you seen this <laughs> but because i'm her son it's hard to take advice from me and those things happen a lot yeah. because of the people that are closest to us uh, and i think that we can lead by example unfortunately and i really hope it isn't like that with, with your husband is that a lot of people have to have something so serious happen to actually take action. Yeah. Have to have a heart attack. But unfortunately, in the, in the stories that happened with my dad, there wasn't coming back from that. Yeah. So hopefully people have a second chance, and I really hope people do, but some people have to have those sorts of extreme things happen before they take action, mm. which is horrible. Uh, but it's the truth, yeah. yeah. On the note of you, what you just said, you just said something that relates quite highly to me, where you, Others are putting pressure on people to change, and they often, you know, don't want to know, face away from it. My ex-wife put quite a lot of pressure on me when we were married to change. She wanted me to lose weight, she wanted me to have a social life, but because I was too busy working, trying to provide, I didn't have time for these things. You know, it was quite difficult. Um, and now we're not together anymore, these things are happening naturally. You know, I've got, got quite a good social life. I'm now just about near a year after in the right frame of mind to lose weight. And although it's probably not the case in that lady's position, she's genuinely concerned. It was a, almost a control thing for her, but I didn't see it at the time. I thought she was just, you know, she knows best, she knows best. Yeah. But I still rebelled against that because I, it was like almost a subconscious thing. I didn't want to do what somebody else told me to, but because of that stress, that stopped me from doing it. Do you, do you know what I mean? It kind of you understand what I'm saying? Sense, yeah, and it makes you not want to do it more. Like, I'll get it. I'm told I need to do the washing, and then I'll accidentally forget to do it. it will I will honestly forget to do it? Considering my wife's sitting next to you, I will honestly forget to do it. But there's something in me that says you're not going to do it because you've been told to do it. Yeah. I'll have times in the car, as immature as it sounds, where I'll be sniffing, she'll pass me a tissue, and I won't blow my nose because she's told me to do it. <laughs> Five minutes later, I'll ask for a tissue, and then I'll do it under my juice. <laughs> and I think a lot of the times we put up defences because 
we want to be in control of our own decisions. And sometimes we're pushed to do things we don't want to do, which makes us rebel against them. How, how many times have kids done it? I know of, of my niece. Oh. Hey, it's relaxing. Um, I know of my niece that if you tell Edith not to do something, she'll want to do it more. Kids do it. If you, just like if I tell a client not to eat a pizza, they're going to probably want to eat pizza. If I start banning foods all the time, they're going to want to eat more of those banned foods. And it goes with changing our health as well. If we've been pushed and pushed and pushed by someone to change our health, we start not liking those things. And we put a negative kind of marker on those things, which we, we may love that person, and they may think they're doing it out of love, but they're doing it out of control. Again, it might be something that's happened earlier on in their life that they had to control. So it's, yeah, it, it's a hard one to go through in depth with that. Don't know in the complete story, but that's my thoughts on it. But don't you think if you know who you are and you're happy who you are, you can't possibly be controlled? I'd like to think so. And it's rebel. making sure you remind Every yourself. Time. Yeah, it, it's reminding yourself who you are and checking in with yourself. Very few people are truly free, though, are they? Yeah, there, there's loads of things that we live in a parent free world, but there's loads of things we have to abide by because of laws. But it's how we perceive something that's going on and how we let it affect us. We We're can much all get. Than we think we are. We're much freer than yeah. we think we are. It's, there's there's a, a book called The Mind Made Prison, and I read this on one holiday, and it talks about not knowing why we do things, and that our mind is actually a prison that we're, we're locked in, and this guy was chopping up sausages, not lengthways, but widthways, and his wife said, why do we do these things? Well, why do you chop up that sausage and put it in there? He says, I don't know, my mum used to do it. And he ends up bringing up uh, this person. She brings up his mum. Says, why do you chop these sausages up? I don't know. My mum used to do it. And it turns out, because it had gone down the generations, that we'd just been brought up with someone doing this, her, his granddad used to chop them up because they couldn't afford the, the saucepan to actually fit the sausages lengthways in. And it was because of that that it had then gone on and on down the generations. A lot of the things that we're kind of trapped in in our minds have been pushed on us from our parents, from their parents, from their parents, and so on. And as well, like, I'm not getting into loads of depth because it, it'll be up for debate. A lot of people that do bad things has been an influence from their parents, which has been influenced by their parents as well. And it goes down the generations. I think as well, like if there's there's people that can be happy, and we we look at we don't think we're in a free world. But if anyone's read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Anyone read that here? Amazing book. And he was, he was in Auschwitz, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And he'd written books, his whole life works, he'd gone into Auschwitz, been split up from his wife. And he was still finding positives when being in a concentration camp. And he was still having laughs every single day when he was in the concentration camp. And it was up to him to actually get this positive out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think he said, yeah, well, I've lost those books that I've written, they've been burnt, whatever it was, and he ended up writing more and become a famous speaker, famous author, famous, uh, I think he was a psychiatrist as well, something like that. And it's absolutely massive to see that someone could be in what we would consider hell, but still get freedom in it every single day because of his mind. Where, so if we don't live in a free world, how can he be free in a place where you're locked up in overcrowded cabins, ready to go off for your death. And there are a lot of people in paradise who you think they're free on Instagram, but they're locked up thinking they're going to get a better selfie. Exactly. <laughs> and not enjoy themselves on the beach. Mm -hmm. oh. mm. Well, I think it's to do with self-acceptance. More than being, being happy, to accept oneself. Yeah. As you are, warts and all. It, it takes a lot, especially in, in social media nowadays, getting thrown at us all the time. It's absolutely crazy. You know, we, we want to accept ourselves, we get close to doing it, and then we end up, oh, maybe I can't be like that. It take, takes a lot to do it, and you have to keep being on the ball to do it as well. Anyone else? At all? Yeah, I've got a question. Go for it. Is it true that we all have a blueprint within us that 
down of the, of the weight in the beer. I heard this. I I've heard it, but I, I don't believe that it's 100% true yet. Some genetics are going to play a part. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's just really interesting because my weight is always comfortable around 56 kilograms. Now, sometimes I go up, sometimes I go down. But I always come back there. And my mum, the same. Well, we can have some. So I just wondered whether there's actually some truth in this. I don't know if anybody else has tried to either gain weight or lose weight and found themselves always returning to this. It, it helps. Number. There's a thing in our body called homeostasis, which is the norm essentially. And we put on something called the allostatic load, which for stress, for example, we go along at this level of stress, then we put this load on, that the stress level is now right up here. And we end up that your body then sees that as normal. And that goes with weight loss a lot as well. That once you get to a weight, it's easier to maintain it. If you keep doing similar things for a long while, it becomes a new norm, where my norm seems to be around 100 kilos. Probably 10 years ago, it was about 90 kilos. And it always changes. Oh, well, it always changes. It stays around that, and you have to make a conscious effort, I suppose, to get down to a new low and stay at that low for long enough for your body to see it as the norm. So I believe you can change it, with the right training, with the right mindset, with the right nutrition, but there could be. I haven't looked into it, into the depths of <coughs> the level to have the right knowledge around it. Cool, thank you. Cool. Anyone else? All good. Oh. Cool. Uh, I'll, I'll let you say your last bit. Well, I really appreciate you guys for coming and saying for half past when I thought it was nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise for that. I could have actually not rushed through those slides and got the power back on. And you would have had five minutes more to go to the toilet. But, yeah, if you guys want any of the slides, just, I've turned it off now, but uh, just go on Facebook, Ollie, OJ, yeah, Ollie Jordan Matthews is out now. Um, and just drop me a message. Uh, the business page is Ollie Matthews. Or you can just go on revitalizationblueprint.com there's books here if any of you guys want them. I've got business cards. They're on the desk, aren't they? Or uh, they've gone now. Yeah. They've got, yeah. But they've I'm got in the Yes Group page and anything. If you've got Flavia, like, it's easy enough to find me if you want to ask me any questions. Or any questions, just let me know. Uh, I'm constantly putting out videos on Facebook. Uh, I try and put out four to five videos a week with regards to Facebook Lives and things like that. So there's a lot of content there that you guys can, can look at. You might at. even be lucky enough to see me dress you with purple. <laughs> it's just weekends. <laughs> <laughs> I've not got suit. I've got Deadpool. I dressed up as Deadpool in my life. Just the mask and Donatello. I got a lot of turtles things, and that that was my passion to grow up and be a turtle. And then it was to play PlayStation. And as we get told by parents, you have to get a real job. Let alone now, there's people earning millions of dollars playing PlayStation. So thanks, mum. Anyway. <laughs> Right, yeah, so. Ollie, you could also pop some of those links if you want in the um, Yes Group Norwich Personal Development page. Oh, yeah. one that you're in. So if, if you want to share those with more people to use. Yeah, I'll pop those links in there. Yeah, um, and the, I'll pop the podcast with a yeah. link to my podcast, which is it's essentially great. just the Facebook Lives going on there. And the uh, podcast with Roger as well. Yeah. What Ollie didn't tell you is that he is in fact part of our team now. Oh, yeah. He's joined the team oh. from this month, so you can catch up. But I'm not here next month. <laughs> <laughs>